supersized two-part Empire podcast this week. We have four, count them, four interviews, hence the bumper-sized two-part thing. There's David Thewlis, Rosamund Pike, Richard Armitage, and... Judd Apatow, plus usual news and nonsense on the movie podcast has suddenly become the longest two-parter since Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame, which reminds me, we must talk about the portal scene, guys. That's a good idea. Right One of these days. (laughs) One of these days, we will talk about the portal scene. Hello, Pod. I'm Chris Hewitt. Welcome to the Empire Podcast, which this week, yes, indeed, for the first time ever, is brought to you in two parts because there's just too much damn pod to go around. So last week, you'll recall, I had a four-guest problem for this week. Well, no, if you want to have your question read out on the Emperor Podcast and treat it with the respect it deserves, as at Nigel Lockett 2 and at Shane Sweeney 13 found to their cost, you can get in touch with us via a number of methods where, uh, well, it's mainly Twitter these days, let's be honest. Uh, you can either just get in touch with me directly at Chris Hewitt over at Emperor Magazine on Twitter. Use the hashtag Emperor Podcast. My DMs are also open, which is dangerous, but so far uh, <laughs> I've, I've been okay. And uh, uh, so you can slide into my DMs and ask questions as well as indeed Shane Sweeney did. All right, time for one more guest, and we'll call it a day for this part of the podcast. Uh, should we have another British thesp, guys? Yeah. Why not? Why not, indeed? This time is Richard Armitage, a man who has played a dwarf and wolverine. Now that is range, and he is displaying that range to great effect with a new audiobook out this week on Audible. It's entitled The Chekhov Collection of Short Stories, and it is a collection of short stories by Anton Chekhov, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> And the book is not only Armitage's idea, but he recorded it all himself in a little fort from which he spoke to me earlier this week at his home in New York. Uh, We talked about that. We talked about his love of Chekhov, not the book from Star Trek. We talked about Captain America, in which he appeared briefly, and all sorts. Do please enjoy. Delighted to be joined on the Empire podcast in lockdown, of course, because we're we're socially responsible by Richard Armitage. How are you, sir? I'm very good. I'm in a I'm in a little <laughs> fort, <laughs> a little cupboard. <laughs> you are. I mean, this is this is this isn't being recorded visually, so I'll describe. Richard is not lying. He is in your you're, you're, you're in your wardrobe at the moment, and you've got blankets well, around. I you. was in a wardrobe, but I've shifted locations now, so um, I'm actually in a hallway with um, a clothes rail. And some packing blankets that I've stapled to the wall <laughs> and kind of cushions everywhere to sort of stop the reflection and, and a, a little plug in LED lamp so that I can see. But it's great. It's working really well. I'm enjoying it. And so this is your, your fort that you've constructed yourself so it that is. you can continue yes. to work, uh, whilst on lockdown. Yeah. With a, with a little bit of help from my friends, uh, Sean Dooley and Jacob Dodman, who, really helped me figure out what equipment to buy and sent me videos of how to set up pro tools and so yeah lots of uh, lots of actors helping out helping each other out to keep working this is amazing because I, I've I've interviewed a number of actors over the last. Uh, in fact, we got Rosamund Pike on this week's episode as well, and I asked her exactly the same question. You know, as an actor, you have this impulse to create, and that's been taken away from you. You can't go on stage. You can't you can't shoot a film. You can't shoot a TV show. Uh, so some people, some actors, I can imagine, might be lost. And you have come up with this perfect remedy by recording this audiobook, this 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 collection of Chekhov short stories, and and creating. Your little fort, which is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's something that I I've been, I've been doing it for quite a while now, and I think um, it's it's always a little bit underestimated. You know, audiobooks and are, are sort of seen as a thing that actors do in between jobs to fill in the time. But I've really enjoyed doing them over the years, and and actually, this was a perfect opportunity to really understand the technology and be able to work from home. And and even when the studios go back, I'm probably going to continue working from home I'm, I'm actually getting a slightly more permanent setup of a studio because i love working in my own time and being able to get up at you know if i can't sleep in the middle of the night i can go into the studio and just keep keep reading and uh it's it's been a, a, a real lifeline during lockdown i have to say i guess that speaks to the idea with this collection in particular because as you say you have you've recorded audiobooks before and you've been doing it for a number of years now uh but with this collection in particular you seem to be the driving force it was your choice to do this your choice your selection of the stories as well yeah i mean i was working on uncle vanya directed by ian rickson in the west end um and during the the preparation for the show i'd read a lot of the chekhov short stories and um as a way to kind of understand the playwright and 
during the run, I suddenly thought this would be a really good idea to try and incorporate uh, some stories for Audible in connection with the with the play because I was sort of in a world of of Chekhov and I thought oh it's another way for people that maybe that couldn't get to see the play that they could mm. kind of hear some of Chekhov's writing and then of course lockdown happened and the theatre closed down and uh, it became even more important because we were still looking for ways to try and rejuvenate that production but but in the meantime. I felt that it was a good idea to sort of push this through uh, almost as a as a little sweetener for people that had maybe had their tickets cancelled or something just to try and you know keep the the stories alive and you know I I love Chekhov and these stories these stories were great so so it happened and a lot of these stories you were discovering for the first time as you were preparing for Uncle Fania is, is that is that correct some of them yes yeah. some of them I was familiar with and uh uh, like the kiss, for example, that was a it's a little favourite of mine. But um, certainly for Vanya, I was I'd looked at Ward Six, which actually was Audible's choice, and I completely understand why they chose it. But um, the idea of uh, of a kind of insane asylum <laughs> and a, and a doctor and a patient, I just felt was not only relevant for the character I was playing, but it feels relevant for the times we're living in. <laughs> Mm, yeah, very much so. I feel like we're living we're living in an insane asylum where we've all <laughs> become. We all thought we were the doctors, and suddenly we're we're the patients, we're the <laughs> inpatients. It's, it's strange, isn't it? We are. We are. We're living in a short story, or yeah. you know, actually, a story that seems without end at the moment. But I know. <laughs> you never please know. Say, please say the end. <laughs> are you? Yeah, usually I don't get that in an interview until at least 10 minutes in, so <laughs> <laughs> please stop this. Please, please stop. The end. Please, please free stop. me from my misery. Um, but I'm fascinated by how, how you do this and your, your technique and your approach to, to audiobooks, uh, which are becoming huge these days as well. Um, and you see these as full-blown well, maybe not full blown, but you see these as performances. You know, that this is a real chance for the, for the actor in you to, to play a multitude of characters. Yeah, it's true. I, I never saw it that way, really. I just started reading. And I mean, one of the first audiobooks I ever did was, um, was Robin Hood when I was working on Robin Hood. And, um, <laughs> obviously I had access to all of the characters' voices because I was working with them every day. And I thought, well, you know, w why not just go there with every character? And it, it just evolved from there that it's not really, it doesn't quite impact if you just read the words. You sort of have to get in to the world of the story. And I, I, you know, I'm not sure how any other actor approaches it, but but as the as the reader, you become the director, so you set the scene, you get to play all the characters, so you can kind of direct the characters to to how how you'd like them to to sound, and you're relying mm. on the author to give you a good description of them. But um, it's it's something I I just really enjoy, and and every time I read something, my my imagination is triggered, so I just go into my own little world and and perform the characters, and and actually it's given rise to some interesting developments for me personally because I've I've optioned a couple of titles that I've read and I'm developing them now as television shows. So these are the uh, the Joy Ellis books, is that is that the Joy Ellis books and also um, the Taking of Annie Thorne by C J Tudor. They're both books that I I was very passionate about and I've taken them into um, into early production development. Yeah. Oh, fantastic! Well, I wish you all the best on Thank that. You. And in, in terms of in terms of that performance, in terms of playing multiple characters uh, in <clears throat> in the Jack of Short Stories, or indeed in, in the novels that you've read as well, how do you do it? Because full disclosure here, occasionally I will read a book out loud to my wife, just as a as a way of you know keeping ourselves entertained. And sometimes a few days will elapse between reading one chapter and then going back to it. And I can never remember the voices I do. So, <laughs> so they, um, they, they fairy wildly. Do you have a chart? Is it instinct? How does, how does it work? How do you keep track? Yeah, I, I, I suffer from the same thing, especially if, for example, with Joy Ellis, the, there's seven books that I've read, and sometimes there's a year or six months that passes between the reading. So I do rely on the producer to say, I can't quite remember what that <laughs> character sounded like. And, and also I've sort of moved now from... You know, it, to me, it's not an exercise in sort of showing off how many different dialects I can do. It becomes much more kind of tonal or, um, in, you know, pitch oriented so that you, sometimes too many accents can just distract the, the listener. So, um, the, the, the performances have become slightly more subtle over the years. And, and that's tricky as well because, I mean, I usually put myself as a, 
uh, as one of the voices. So the the character that feels like the base narrator, I usually use a version of myself mm-hmm. um, because you're usually narrating and commenting. Uh, you, you're also the author's voice, so you, you kind of have to live in that area. But, you know, when you use Pro Tools, I, I make a note of... Um, the, the, the first reference for the character. So, I, you, but before I learned how to do that, I would make notes in a book to just give the quality of the voice and and then the subtle accent that I'd chosen. So, yeah, you do you do have to make notes. Oh, that's interesting. I, I thought maybe you had like a, a a tape, a series of tapes. You would just listen to one very very quickly, get a refresher course. That's how that guy sounds, and then go for it. Yeah, I mean to be honest as well, I I um. You, you can usually remember because the, the books that you read are, uh, are usually quite high quality. You can usually remember what voices you, what you've done because especially if they're not too planned, if they come out of an instinctive response to the reading, that instinct comes back again when you, when you go mm. back in there to read it. I mean, w- with the Charles Dickens, uh, I mean, Dickens is a perfect example that he, his description of the characters are so succinct that the, the voices I didn't have to plan or think of any of the voices. They just came through reading his descriptions, and Interesting. that's brilliant. And, and so, talk me through the the uh, the Chekhov short stories that that you've chosen. So there there are six in this collection. There are six. I'm just pulling up my notes because <laughs> <laughs> I will get this wrong. Have um, you forgotten so, already, Richard? What's going on? <laughs> there's always one I miss out. So so Ward Six. There's Ward Six, The Kiss, uh-huh. Betrothed, uh-huh. The Black Monk. Uh-huh. Neighbours, not to be confused with the Australian soap, <laughs> and the student, um, all of which were chosen by myself and actually Ian Rickson, who had directed Chekhov, because I was putting together a, a short list of our favourite stories, and I just said to him, you know, which stories do you like? Because um, I thought it'd be nice to have his opinion on this. So he he gave me his list, and actually there were a couple that, that crossed over. So there were some that I didn't know, and some that I was very familiar with, and so I, I, that's how I came upon the list. Uh, for Phyllis like myself, who may only know things like Chekhov's gun, the notion of Chekhov's gun in terms of how it pertains to cinema, and of course, the Chekhov was a Star Trek, different Chekhov, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll go with that. Um, what is it about Chekhov that that has connected with you in such in such a way? I mean, I was introduced to him when I was at drama school. We did the cherry orchard in in my third year, and um, y- you know, when you're studying acting, Chekhov, Chekhov comes up because really the root of our work that we do as modern actors came through um, that that school of theatre, which was Stanislavski and Chekhov working together um, to create a a new form of drama which was rooted in a kind of naturalism that wasn't particularly plot driven it was more about characters and and how they how they existed and and it's the thing the thing that i love about chekhov is that he he doesn't intervene too much and manipulate the character to try and give you a message he he creates a character and then lets them live on the page and he does the same thing in the stories he's observing life rather than pushing an agenda or having a political stance. And actually, he was criticized in his life because um, other writers felt that he was never, you know, pushing forward his views on anything, which is sort of the whole point of him. And, you know, he was um, a doctor for for most of his time and life. And in his spare time, his hobby, mm. he was a writer. I mean, he, uh, he famously dis- he said, you know, um, medicine is my wife and writing is my mistress you know that he saw it as a sort of flirtation with something but but and actually his plays are fewer than his stories but he he gives us something he was writing over 120 years ago but he gives us something an insight into our own lives by looking backwards into a historic writer like Chekhov but but his observations of the human condition and human spirit are so brilliant they're, they're humorous and they're tragic and they are uplifting um so yeah I, i'm deeply moved by them and i'd find myself laughing at them because they're sort of removed from modern society yet mm. totally relevant it's a very long answer to a very short question sorry. <laughs> no it's good it was, it was fine you, you think you, you covered off everything but uh when people hear the word the name Chekhov, I think sometimes they can they can feel that it's it's going to be heavy going, it's going to be heavy duty, it's going to be hard hitting, quite bleak. I think that's well, that is the traditional receipt of what we think we know about Chekhov, and actually, w- the revelation of di- of performing in Uncle Vanya was that the minute we put it in front of an audience, 
primarily because we had Toby Jones playing on Galvania. So, you know, <laughs> it was already starting to, to sort of fizz that it was an absolute un undoubted comedy it, from, from the minute the play started. And, and none of us quite realized what it, what the, the play was. And, and I think, um, finding that slightly cynical humor and, you know, enjoyment of human foible in Chekhov is, I think that's the essence that I, that I was looking for rather than the misery because he's writing at a time which was, which was hard on, on his, um, his class. And, you know, he was upwardly mobile coming from, from very little. And so his observations mm. of the bourgeoisie were, were quite acid. <laughs> <laughs> but, and he was criticized for that. And he was, you know, he was highly critical of his own profession as a doctor. So, um, I, I, I don't know. He, it, it feels like a human being writing about human beings rather than an intellectual uh, making some kind of, you know, clever statement about it. Well, I think that's mm. why it feels so fresh to me. And uh, on the complete opposite end of the scale, going from Chekhov to uh, to Marvel, uh, you mentioned Toby Jones. I mean, obviously, you were both in the first Captain America film, but you were never yeah. on screen together. <laughs> so were. did you did you share experiences uh, in the uh, in rehearsals in the dressing rooms? We didn't actually. I mean, I uh, it's a shame we never met, but that's the nature of filming is that you're you're often kept apart. The thing that I was most <laughs> um, surprised at because the the weird thing about doing theatre is you is you know after the play you often go out of the stage door and you greet some fans if if you're lucky and you know so i was having a lot of um thorin oakenshield pictures thrust at me <laughs> and, and i realized toby standing next to me signing pictures of dobby the health uh, house elf and i was like i didn't i didn't realize that you played this character and it suddenly made sense to me and i and i real and i started to see the the animation and see him and then and then, through, you know, on stage at night, I'd often look over at him and sort of see Dobby the house, house elf <laughs> playing Uncle Barney. And it just, it just cracked me up. And, you know, he, he's a great guy. He's such a brilliant person to work with that, you know, he just doesn't take himself seriously. He takes the work seriously, but we had a great time and, uh, uh, it was. It's a shame we didn't meet on Captain America, but, but yeah. <laughs> well, you were too busy being bumped off very early on. I was too busy chewing on a cyanide tooth. <laughs> Precisely. That was at a time when it was still a huge gamble. It was still. I remember interviewing Chris Evans, and he had these hobbit-like things in his feet, and there was this feeling that it was just no one knew how it was going to turn out. You mean um, the the the, the um, Captain America movie? Yeah, and in fact, and everything that's, that's sprung from that since. That's true. I mean, I guess there was Iron Man, which everyone was. I mean, that wasn't that many years before Captain America, was it? So no, everyone, a couple. I remember seeing the first Iron Man film and thinking, "This is this is something brand new." Mm. His performance, and and I think that everything sprung from that. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was my first experience of really working on a lot of green screen and, and, and working on a huge, huge set with 200 cast and crew, you know, with a crew of like hundreds and hundreds of people. So w then when I kind of got to New Zealand and started working on The Hobbit, it didn't freak me out in a way that it probably would have done if I hadn't been part yeah. of Captain America. So it was a really good training ground for me. But gosh, I can't believe it's 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> something I feel old. Do you feel old now? Is it? I feel very old. I think <laughs> 2021, I'm going to be 50. And that I just can't believe or accept, actually. I'm going <laughs> to completely deny that. How was 40 for you? How was turning 40? 40 was good. I think I might have been in New Zealand or going down there. But yeah, 40 was good. This decade for me has been great. I mean, I've got to say, I don't like 2020 very much, but no, it's terrible. But it's been a great time for me. I've got to, for any, any actors out there kind of up and coming or, you know, trying to graduate this year um, that have doubts, you know, it, uh, your twenties feel good, but it can get better. So I'd say my, my, my forties have, have been creatively the best years of my life. You know what? I'm actually starting to look forward to my 50s because I feel like you can just get fat and go grey <laughs> and be like, I don't, it doesn't matter now because I'm 50. You know, you can <laughs> just just go away and let me be 50 in my little in my little cupboard here, yeah. recording just eating, all by myself. Yeah, eating donuts. Absolutely. But here's the thing, Richard. You can skip 2020. I think we can officially strike 2020 from the record now so technically speaking you won't turn 50 until 2022 so you've That's got another year true i've got yeah i'm going to give myself another year it's <laughs> been an interesting period though this lockdown you know i think it was almost a choice to 
make sure you, you, you deal with it well. And um, as a as a sort of semi <laughs> introverted, slightly antisocial person, anyway, the the, <laughs> the social distancing wasn't wasn't that tricky for me. And actually, I've used the time as as well as I could, and you know, tried to stay off social media too much and and be you kind of just be quiet for a while and and uh, you know i've done a lot of work developing these stories and done a lot of reading and uh it's it's actually not been as bad as i thought it was going to mm. be i've 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 learned something about myself time time to come out of hiding now though i think <laughs> yeah. precisely and then just a couple of last things before i let you go um talking about re- reflecting on your career and this idea that in your 20s it it, it can be a struggle and I, I presume it was a struggle for you in 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 some ways um you know looking back uh, i was looking at your imdb earlier on and in this year's love you're credited as smug, smug man, man at, at a party. party that's who which... i am i am a smug man <laughs> at a party <laughs> That is the definition of where my career started and will probably end. <laughs> but, but Smug Man at Party did get punched quite, quite, you know, full on in the face by uh, right. Dougie That's Henshaw. Right. So, yeah. That's right. So, but how, so how, do you, question? <laughs> how do you prepare for playing Smug Man at Party? And, 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 and at the time, what were your feelings about that? I am playing Smug Man at Party, but I'd rather be playing, I'd rather be doing Uncle Fania. I just, you know, how I prepared for it by just being myself. As I said, I'm Smug Man at Party. Um, <laughs> improv. You know what? And this is something again. It, I, I'm sort of starting t- taking steps to try and mentor students and do some work with the, this year's graduates who have had their careers, you know, their career launches stunted. And, and this is something that I would say to any any actor breaking in or, or starting life in the profession is: I always prepared every role as if it was a leading character because I. I hoped and some somewhere deep down knew that I would be playing a leading character one day and I just mm. needed to keep practicing how I was going to play it and how I would do the preparation. So I've got ridiculous notes, maybe not for Smug Man at Party, but for, <laughs> you know, t- two lines in Casualty. I've got like lots of notes of who the character is, where he was born, where he came from, how he was educated, what he likes, what music does he listen to? Because <laughs> I just felt like create a whole person there so that when you do get the chance to play something more in depth you've got tools to do it so Mm. um and that's the advice and it's the same with um with auditioning for things i always say imagine that that the the audition they've 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 said to you actually someone's dropped out you're going to have to go on and play this role tomorrow either on stage or on film um just give us a taste of what of how you would play it um, the role's yours, but but just give us a, a shot at it. So, so you oh. fully fully commit to to whatever it is you're doing, and and it's the same with with uh, everything that I try to apply myself to now. I I throw myself all in, and uh, equally with audio books, you know. And you, you say some people are a bit nervous about reading, and and uh, but you've got to be fully committed, and and I think that was maybe that should be on my my tombstone is that he was fully committed because that's how i feel richard armitage has been an absolute pleasure uh, enjoy the rest of the day in your fort thank you chris hewitt thank you cheers <laughs> Okay, so that was Richard Armitage from his little fort, and the Chekhov collection of short stories is available now, right now, only on Audible. And that is it for the first part of this week's Bumper Size podcast. Join us in part two, a separate episode, of course, in which I speak to Rosamund Pike and Judd Apatow. We review the week's big releases, and we discuss the movie news. Bangly bye? That'll do. Bangly bye. Bangly bye.